Welcome to this Ozarks Voices Oral History Interview, part of an ongoing series of oral history interviews produced and preserved by the Missouri State University Libraries. I'm Tom Peters, Dean of Library Services at Missouri State University. Today is Tuesday, June 30th, 2015. The location of this interview is the Rafferty Home in Springfield, Missouri. Our special guest today is Dr. Milton D. Rafferty, Professor Emeritus of Geography, Geology, and Planning at Missouri State University, formerly known as Southwest Missouri State University. He is the author of many books, including his landmark study, The Ozarks, Land and Life, second edition, 2001, University of Arkansas Press, and Rude Pursuits and Rugged Peaks, arguably the best, most instructive edition of the Journal of Henry Stowe Schoolcraft's Trek into the Ozarks in the late 1818 and early 1819. Dr. Rafferty, it is a pleasure to speak with you today. You bet. Thanks. Thanks very much. So you've studied, observed, and written about the Ozarks for approximately half a century. Um, as you look back on your engagement with the Ozarks region, what do you think are the most salient aspects of Ozarks life and culture? If you could spend another 50 years kind of drilling down into various aspects, what would you want to focus on? What do you see as the, the key aspects? Well, one theme I've always enjoyed looking at in all my work, really, is looking at change over time. Um, in fact, one of the reasons I got into writing about the Ozarks was that uh, so much of the literature was pretty dated. Mm -hmm. And when I started uh, teaching and uh, taught a course on the geography of Missouri and then later uh, geography of the Ozarks, and a lot of the material was just simply out of date so bad. I thought, well, I, I spent a lot of time getting statistics together that was updated. Mm -hmm. And uh, tremendous, especially the agricultural data at that time was really uh, terribly uh, behind times. Mm -hmm. And that's really what got me started thinking about how much change there had been mm -hmm. uh, in the Ozarks. I'm sure a lot of places uh, yeah. all over the United States had changed, but uh, the literature that was out, I think it was kind of a neglected area as far as people writing about it. I don't think that's true anymore because a lot of people are writing about the Ozarks now. Mm -hmm. And that's good. Yeah. Uh, did, when, you, did, when did you sort of realize that really studying the Ozarks was going to become your life's work? Well, I, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not really sure. My first uh, encounter with the Ozarks was in 1953 when I was inducted into the Army at uh, Camp Crowder, mm -hmm. uh, just outside Neosho. And I was there, I, uh, my friend and I had volunteered for the draft, thinking we'd get to stay together perhaps. Well, we were together seven days. <laughs> <laughs> and then my next encounter was uh, just when I went from Crowder, I went to Fort Leonard Wood. And I got a lot better acquainted with the Ozarks down there. Uh, I went through nine weeks of infantry training and then uh, nine weeks of combat engineers training. Uh -huh. And we climbed a lot of hills, crossed a lot of streams, <laughs> <laughs> built bridges, tore them down, blew them up. Noticed a lot of rocks, <laughs> I imagine. Right. <laughs> um, but you mentioned that one of the things that really interests you is change. So do you think the Ozarks region of today is radically different from the Ozarks of the mid-1960s, from the mid-20th century? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I came to uh, Springfield in 1966. I was, uh, uh, had gotten a job at uh, Southwest Missouri State College at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, things were a lot different. Uh, there's been a tremendous population growth in the Ozarks. Not everywhere, but uh, a lot of Towns have become cities, yeah. uh, small cities, and just you know, new people coming into the region, new industries, uh, just the growth in the education uh, institutions has been remarkable. All the junior colleges that are now mm -hmm. available for people mm -hmm. that uh, you know to go to Springfield to school was quite a thing at one time. 
but now they can get OTC or one of the other junior colleges mm -hmm. just outside the door practically. Yeah. And I think that has been a real agent of change. Uh, the availability of education, the all the media mm -hmm. has brought new ideas in and um, that all has started, I suppose, with radio in a big way, yeah. but in television is, you know about the world if you turn the television on. Yes, yeah. Um, you know, one of the things I really appreciate about your book is that you define the Ozarks region. There's a map that shows where the boundaries yeah. of the Ozarks are. And I, I thought that needed to go in there. <laughs> yeah, and I've seen it, you know, a lot of people sort of accept that. This is the Ozarks. And so it's four states, Missouri, Arkansas. Most people would say, yeah, it's this region of Missouri. Right. But it's also eastern Oklahoma and extreme southeastern Kansas. Kansas, right. And you and then there are some people that say, well, really, southern Illinois is part of the Ozarks. It just happens to be right. divided by the Mississippi River. But you make an argument in your book that really it's not part of the Well, I, that's a, uh, I got most of my information on the physical boundaries of the Ozarks from uh, uh, Fenneman's uh, book on geomorphology. Mm -hmm. And they put it, that region, the Shawnee Town Hills, over in the uh, uplands of uh, Kentucky, mm -hmm. and and southern Illinois, southern Indiana, that part is very Ozarkian in character, but, uh, and the Mississippi River makes a wonderful boundary anyway. Right. <laughs> so I cut it off at the Mississippi River. It's hard to miss. Um, so you called your landmark study the Ozarks Land and Life. And what, what do you see as fundamentally that relationship between land and life? It, it, you know, do the hills and the karst topography of the Ozarks, do you think they have a fundamental influence on the lives and the culture and the society and the history of these hill people? Uh, well, uh, in times past they certainly did because it was not easy to go places. Mm -hmm. um, it, and it took time to go places. A trip to Branson was uh, maybe a two day trip. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> so people didn't have the information and uh, the latest news uh, like we do today. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, yes, I do think that the, the and, and the way people had to make their living on the, in rural areas. The area is very rural, mm -hmm. always has been, changing, of course, mm -hmm. but uh, um, I grew up in an area in Kansas, you might say was isolated because there it was just distance, but here's distance plus rugged terrain and mm -hmm. rough going. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just, new things didn't come in just overnight. Right. And that may be why it's sort of a, as my friend Bob Flanders says, a semi-arrested frontier. Mm -hmm. It's, things just didn't move along quite as fast as they did other places. Yeah. Because it wasn't easy for that to happen here. We'll come back to transportation in a minute, but you know, when I, uh, I, I'm not a native Ozarker. I, uh, I've only been here three years. I'm just fascinated by the region and the people and the culture and the society and um, the landscape. Um, but I, I remember I was shocked when I saw a map of railroads in the Ozarks. And it was, you could almost define the Ozarks by how railroads sort of went around the Ozarks. There were very few rail lines in the Ozarks. And when I first saw that map, I thought, well, like, it has to be from like the late 19th century. There's only like three lines through the Ozarks. And I looked and it was like 1950. <laughs> mm. I mean, just transportation, like you say, getting through the, and around in the Ozarks was a major, were they talking about riverboats or railroads or right. good roads? It was not an insignificant. That was all around the edges. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With a few exceptions. Yeah. White River is maybe a... They really get some of those uh, small craft up the right, White River quite a ways. You know? Yes, they did. Yeah. Yes, they did. Well, let's talk about Henry Schoolcraft for a minute. Um, the bicentennial of his uh, trek into the Ozarks is only three years away now. Um, 
you've edited his uh, journal. Uh, you've uh, written about him in Ozark's Land and, and Life. Um, my understanding was he was here. He was here basically looking for mineral deposits. Um, what do you think is what's the long term impact of Schoolcraft's trek and the journal about that journey into the Ozarks? Well, it it certainly is the best record we have of. Uh, 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 well, the best early picture, if you will, for writing about the Ozarks by someone who was a good writer and had uh, a good um, background in geology and especially mineralogy. Mm-hmm. And anyone who has read his book knows that he has a lot to say about rocks and minerals. Mm-hmm. and But also that all the... Uh, vegetation, the wildlife, and the people, uh, as many as a few that there were here, mm-hmm. that he encountered on the White River. Yeah. It's the first picture we had of what people lived, how they lived at that time. Of, of white settlement in the Yes, Ozarks, yes. Right. right. Yeah. Right. Um, and there were, uh, Native Americans had populated the region oh, for yes, a yes. long time. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, the Osage were primary. Were, were they the primary tribe uh, pre-contact? In yes, the, I in think they were, that, that was the main tribe that was here, and then at that time they they were the landlords of the Ozarks, I guess you would say, uh-huh. until it was taken away from them. Um, so we mentioned that the Ozarks as a region encompasses four states, um, parts of four states. Um, Do you think that helps or hurts the Ozarks as identifiable place? I mean, I think of other multi-state regions like the Great Plains, for example. Mm-hmm. Do people that live in the Great Plains identify them as Great Plainers or whatever you call them? Uh, I, I, I think that people in the Ozarks identify themselves as Ozarkers, uh, regardless of which state they happen to be residing in. But I don't know. What do you think? Is it? Well, I think I think. Um since I've lived in the Ozarks and I lived a long time in Kansas where I was where I grew up, uh, I think Kansans identify themselves more as Kansans. And uh, this and certainly people from Missouri and Arkansas identify that as their home state. But they also identify themselves as um, Ozarkians. Mm-hmm. I, I a couple of times I've gone through the Springfield telephone book just to see how many times Ozarks have been. Last time I think there were between four and five hundred businesses or um, uh, organizations, banks, whatever, whatever yeah. named after had the name Ozark in it. Yeah. So there's um, a real liking for that word and a real identification with that region by the people who live here. Yeah. And a lot of people who move into the region become Ozarkers. Become cultured, <laughs> cultured. And, and early on in your, in your second edition of Ozark's Land and Life, you, you, you write the following thing. Uh, a third distinctive cultural element is the Ozarkers' uncommon sense of place. And why do you think that Ozarkers have such a strong sense of, where, I'm an Ozarker, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm part of this place. Um, you know, you know uh, maybe everybody identifies with the place, but it seems stronger in the Ozarks than other places I've lived. What do you think? I, th- I think I th- there's maybe something to that. I, I think that uh, people, especially uh, farmers or people who live in small towns and on, in rural areas, um, you know, they're used to talking about uh, the back 40 or... <laughs> You know, they're very conscious of the of what's on their farm, mm-hmm. and um, or whatever place they're working, and I think that's different than uh, the way people who live in cities uh, think of it. They know their neighborhoods, of course, mm-hmm. but uh, here they they have a real feeling for the uh, how close they are to nature, really. Yeah, and and they. They um, think of that as being a, 
uh, where they're from. Mm -hmm. So there's that identity with local area, and you really see it by the way they name things. You know, as I just mentioned, mm -hmm. that they they like that word. Yeah. Yeah. And they like to identify with it. I know uh, Brooks Blevins, a professor at Missouri State, currently has done some similar kind of analysis looking at um, businesses and organizations that have Ozark or Ozarkian or mm -hmm. uh, Ozark Mountain, uh, whatever, in their name. And he's actually plotted it on a map. I haven't seen the map yet, but he's told mm -hmm. me he's done this. So you can sort of, that's another way to sort of define the Ozarks is through self-definition. If you say you're part of the if your business is in the Ozarks, then we'll put a pinpoint there on that map and say that, you know, and it's interesting. He says it's very interesting to see that it is to kind of mirror your map of how people think about the Ozarks and what is what is the Ozarks. Um, I, I once tried something like that with a, a, a not quite the same uh, uh, approach, but I wrote to all of the U.S. I'm not sure they call it that anymore, but it's the soil conservation offices, which every county has one. Mm -hmm. And I knew that they had to write back. <laughs> <laughs> so what kind of a survey is that? 100% <laughs> response rate, That's guaranteed. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I just asked them, you know, I wrote a little letter to them explaining what I was doing, and I said, do you consider St. Francis County to be in the Ozarks? And, you know, it was really interesting because in the middle of the Ozarks, there certainly was no disagreement with that. But as you got out on the edges of the Ozarks, then there was a lot less uh, response that way. Mm -hmm. That this definitely was in the Ozarks. A lot of times I get things like, well, we're not in the Ozarks, but they're just south of us here. <laughs> or they're just east of us or whatever, you know. Um. Well, I think you also mentioned in your book that um, uh, Harold Bell, Bell Wright's book, Shepherd of the Hills, a lot of people say, well, that's where the Ozarks are, down there in right. Taney and Stone Counties. That's the Ozarks. This is not the Ozarks up here. Yeah, yeah that's um, true. Another thing about the Ozarks that fascinates me is that, uh, you know, every place has its myths, you know. So if you, if you say, well, I'll describe a New Yorker, you'll describe an archetypal mm -hmm. New Yorker. Describe a Californian, you know, you might say, well, Northern California, Southern California, but every place has sort of its mythos, I would guess, I would say. But it's, again, it seems stronger in the Ozarks. And, you know, we've got um, both within, among people who live in the Ozarks and people outside the Ozarks, you just say the Ozarks and images start coming to mind, you know, hillbillies, moonshiners. <laughs> More recently, maybe meth addicts and, you know, traffickers yeah. and methamphetamines. Right. Um, my, I guess my question is, in your opinion, is, do you think that sort of mythic, iconic aspects of the Ozarks, is it stronger, more pronounced in this region than compared to some other regions? You know, would it be in the top 10 if you took 100 regions around the world randomly and said, what, what somehow studied in some semi-rigorous way, what role does myth and uh, play in this de definition of this region? I'm suggesting it would be stronger in the Ozarks than some of these other regions around the world. Yeah, and certainly, and why is, why? certainly the uh, um, well, uh, <clears throat> even during the Civil War, some of the men who came to the Ozarks thought it was and wrote in their letters home and that sort of thing that it was. Some, some of them liked it very much and came back and, and, and lived here. But some of them didn't like the hills. They, you know, people used to seeing uh, deep fertile soils were disappointed yeah. <laughs> in the Ozarks. Uh, well, I think without a doubt the tourism industry has had a tremendous uh, influence on building that that particular yeah. hillbilly image of the Ozarks and uh, Branson and Lake of the Ozarks all around, you find that kind of thing mm -hmm. and the um, hillbilly bands and right. all that sort of thing. There's types, you know, kind of the, the goofball hillbilly who's the comic relief at a show yeah. or something. But it has been an area that 
you know, pretty late. To, a lot of modern things uh, are of fairly recent times. I mean, but that is true of a lot of places in the United States. Uh, you know, they, here in the Ozarks, in one, some ways, they were very advanced. Like, they had electricity uh, mm -hmm. out of the, the dam there at Forsyth. Pa yeah, Power Site Dam. Yeah, Power Site Dam in 1914, they had electricity. Yeah. Yeah. My mother got her first uh, uh, refrigerator in 1955. Uh, she still had it when I got out of the Army in 1955. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know... They were on REA and all that stuff, and a, a pretty recent thing, actually. Yeah. It didn't come for a long time. Yeah. So I grew up with uh, some kerosene lamps and a, a few things like that. And uh, but again, that's part of the mythos of the place that's somehow backward. And yeah. That, that you know that it's not everywhere. It was not modern. Yeah. In some ways. So. But a lot of rural areas were pretty. Uh, isolated for a long time. Yeah. But again, in your, in your book, as you point out, it, it's also um, often perceived as idyllic and, and, and almost like a, a Jeffersonian agrarian mm -hmm. uh, society. Almost the closest thing we've gotten to perfection of that is and persistence of that mm -hmm. Jeffersonian ideal um, is in the Ozarks. I don't know if uh, you know, people come to visit a place, whether it be the Colorado mountains or the Rocky Mountains or the Ozarks, if you come and stay a week or two, all that seems that way. But if you live there all the time, it may not quite seem that way. <laughs> because, you know, if you're away from things and that you're accustomed to, you can stand that for a while. Yeah. But if you're away from those same conveniences and so forth for all your life, it's not so yeah. good sometimes. Yeah. Uh, let me run down a few things that I consider key aspects of the Ozarks region and just what, what are your thoughts on this? Um, so agriculture, is, it fa just totally fascinates me, the agriculture, his, the history of agriculture in the Ozarks region. I mean, as I like to put it, it's, you, you call it a persistent pattern of trial and error. I say they tried everything. They tried tobacco, cotton, uh, yeah. different fruit crops, uh, dairy cattle. Uh, they've tried to grow everything here. Yeah. And canneries and tomatoes and um, do you think that um, uh, well I've had someone who's very knowledgeable in this he, he thinks that um, beef cattle are here to stay that beef cattle are sort of the ideal agricultural use of the Ozarks region do you yeah I, I would agree with that I think I think that uh, and I think I mentioned something about that in my uh, the last edition of my Ozark book because uh, they couldn't compete with apple growers in Washington State and California and all the other right. places. New York State. So the apple industry fell apart. We still have uh, vestiges of a mm -hmm. apple growing here. But at one time they were raising strawberries and trains left Springfield, a whole unit trains, all the cars full of strawberries. And yeah. the big ice house they had down here, downtown in Springfield was there to pack those yeah. box cars with ice. But that's all gone. And that's one reason, uh, one of the books I was using was still telling that in the book. Mm. That's what was going on in the Ozarks. I said, wait a minute, <laughs> got to straighten this out. Yeah. And, uh, but they finally found, so I, I think it was always the cattle industry was always here. Uh, mm. They got into dairying and uh, that uh, is still around and, yeah. and, and uh, we were pretty respectable. We were Missouri dairy. was a big dairy state for yeah, a while. Right. Yeah. And and the dairy farms are still pretty prosperous around here. They have trouble competing again with other areas. But beef cattle um, seems to work best because farming was not good for the Ozarks. Mm -hmm. uh, the hilly parts of it at least. Mm -hmm. you know, as long as they're farming in the river valleys um, that was fine. But when they started plowing up the steep slopes and uh, 
that that wasn't good for the, there wasn't much soil there to begin with right and if they farmed it very long there wasn't any soil left right to mention right right here in my yard i had to haul the yeah. haul dirt in here because i'm on the cedar glade here yeah <laughs> that's the natural vegetation <laughs> and there's two cedar trees just outside the door there yeah and that's the natural vegetation and the soil was about two inches thick yeah <laughs> so i spent quite a bit of money hauling black dirt in here to yeah. get my grass to grow well, I grew up in Iowa where, you know, planting a tree is all of a 15 minute, you know, endeavor. You just dig a hole and plant the tree and water it and away you go. And it took me all day to dig that hole in the ground up here, down here to just to get all that rock out of there. And uh, yeah, you want a bar to yeah, chisel it out. You need a crowbar. Yeah, you to, need something to help you out there. I have a colleague who took a jackhammer to uh, get into things. Um, so you think beef cattle are here to stay. Anything else, you know, do you think wine could be, it's making a comeback. I think the total number of gallons of wine produced in Missouri, I'm thinking, is, is going up. But yeah. do you see that it really could become a major form of agriculture? Again, I think they would always have the problem of competing with uh, the big wine districts in California and other places, but in New York and places mm -hmm. like that. But um, that has some potential, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, the weather here is not always the best suited for the for the grapes, mm -hmm. which you never know what the weather is going to be. So, right. <laughs> right. but um, I think as long as we have local wineries and people are interested in local wines, uh, they they could prosper. Mm -hmm. Another thing I want to ask you about briefly is the lumber industry. And uh, lumber is a major part of the history of the Ozarks. Yes. Um, one thing that fascinates me, as far as I, as far as I know, I, mean, I just don't know about it, but there's no major furniture industry in the Ozarks. And I wonder why not. It was all, it was all basically railroad ties, wasn't it? That, uh, oh, well, in pine. Yeah. Uh, the uh, shortleaf pine was a native tree to the area. And uh, when the first uh, companies came in, like the Missouri Land and, uh, <coughs> Land and Lumber Company, and they were one of the really big operators here out in uh, Shannon County and those, those parts of the Ozarks. Um, a lot of that uh, pine lumber and oak lumber found its way uh, was marketed through Kansas City. I hmm. uh, came across that in some study, and and that was a time when uh, they were settling the plains in the 1870s, 1880s, and that was about the time they started the lumber industry. Got they got the railroads in here, and they could they could actually uh, reach their outside markets, mm -hmm. and that was a marketplace that was close by, and a lot of building going on. Of course. A lot of building going on in a lot of the agricultural states at that time that were being, just being all across the Great Plains. So that kind of bloom frame construction just had a, it really increased the demand for lumber and yeah, um, yeah. This is sort of a cl the closest you know for hundreds of miles around here. This is the closest uh, timber, right? Major, right? Arkansas of timber. and and uh, East Texas and up through Missouri, but uh, then you have to go way north. And, yeah. And a lot of that had already been pretty well worked over. By a lot the of that fueled the uh, growth of Chicago. Yeah. A lot of that lumber came down to right. build Chicago. Right. Um, but really no furniture industry, unlike in like the Carolinas and uh, that I'm aware of. No, I, 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 I really hadn't really thought about that before, but I think that's true that we didn't have any, I mean, there's some people who made specialty furniture, things like that, but no big Nothing on a large commercial scale. operations. Yeah. yeah. Barrel manufacturing yeah. is not furniture, but it's, yeah. it's a more uh, uh, 
furniture like, I guess, in the way they put the barrels together and yeah. that sort of thing. And railroad ties was a big part of it. Yeah, railroad ties. Well, we still do a lot of railroad ties here. The the uh, big grill, you, the tie yard just north of Commercial Street here mm -hmm. is jam packed with ties. Mm -hmm. But now they truck them in, and yeah. they don't they don't creosote them here anymore. Mm. And uh, so they ship them out by truck. Almost wow. all of it goes by truck. Yeah, I, I see. Well, I live on the north side. I see those trucks coming out of there, and yeah, they're un, they're uncreosoted. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, speaking of transportation, so the coming of the railroad was a big uh, for some of these Ozarks communities. That was a transformative event. Oh people, yeah. The railroad really? coming into the Branson area was, it right. changed life. Sure. Um, People could get there easy then. Yeah. And it seriously diminished uh, travel times through the ocean. Oh, yes. Everything really <clears throat> sprouted with, that's why every town was trying to find a railroad. Mm -hmm. um, they even built a few short line railroads, like mm -hmm. the one down to Ava. Mm hmm they wanted a railroad so bad they were willing to take something less than a real railroad. <laughs> right. Uh, and even had some private railroads. Uh, I'm thinking of um, Coin Harvey and Montinay, yeah. uh, his endeavor. Yeah. He built, as far as I understand, he built his own railroad to get tourists out there to where he wanted them to be. Then came the Good Roads Movement, too, which again had a big impact on yeah, the A big ocean. impact, right. Right. And even before that, you know, there were quite a few people. I, I started to write an article about that, and I haven't finished it because I've gone to other things, but I, I got interested in bicy bicycling in the Ozarks, mm -hmm. and that was something, there's a tremendous uh, uh, book that I, I really enjoy reading uh, on the, uh, see if I can remember the name of it, uh, I can't think of it now, but it, it is a, a League of American Wheelmen published it, mm -hmm. and it's a little hard to find that book, but but it's just wonderful to read through it and see where uh, I mean, hardly any of the counties in the Ozarks had a bridge, mm -hmm. you know, there just wasn't any bridges. Yeah, and uh, if they had a hotel to stay in, that was wonderful. You could stay there cheap, seventy five since to a dollar a night <laughs> but I think the real uh, the bicyclers uh, helped to get people interested in traveling in the Ozarks they, they weren't as of course when the automobile came in then it was a big push to get but even bicyclists were basically tourists yeah they in the were basically Ozark. tourists yeah, yeah. I'm Auto, guessing this big, is like the 1880s 1890s was uh, was kind of the big uh, bicycle craze in the United States oh yeah tremendous uh -huh. and and, uh, and they were riding, still riding the old high wheelers, a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were big bicycle clubs in, uh, in uh, St. Louis, uh, Kansas City. I think Springfield had a big bicycle club, a reasonably good sized one, and they would take mm -hmm. tours. And I haven't been able to find much information on, about that subject in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. I've tried to uh, ferret out a copy of, I thought maybe if they did a book like that for Missouri, I think they did it for several states. I, I, if I could find one on Arkansas, then it would help, help uh, mm -hmm. me finish the article. Right. <laughs> I'm still looking. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, and then, uh, Railroads, bicycles, good roads really helped fuel the tourism industry. Oh, basically. yeah, sure. And initially it was, um, yeah, people from St. Louis primarily just were looking for uh, a rustic week or uh, hunting and fishing excursions. Sure. And uh, some of them came out here for their, their health. They wanted to revitalize, rejuvenate. Right. Uh, going into a slower paced rustic environment and sure back to nature kind of movement um yeah and and weekend fishing and hunting that was very very popular yeah and, and uh you know then, then sort of businesses grew up i think of um uh, along the white river that you'd have you know fishing excursions that you could mm -hmm. rent a guide to take you down the river right 
show you the best spots. On the cover of my book uh, on the Ozarks, there's a picture of uh, the old uh, country store at, at Huzzah. Mm -hmm. And that was the family home of uh, Dr. Don McGinnis, who was a good friend of mine. And uh, that they used to keep cabins there on the Huzzah Creek, because Huzzah Creek was a real popular place for them to come close to St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And so they kept, I think they had five or six cabins. Don one day took me on a tour of the farm and showed me where all these things were. Mm -hmm. But it was really impressive. It was a retreat, a rural retreat. Yeah. It was a and, and there are some pretty big ones in there now where they have pretty nice accommodations. Mm -hmm. They had little cabins, yeah. but now they have, you know, all the, all the comforts of home. Uh, another thing about the Ozarks is uh, sort of uh, mineral waters and, and springs and uh, yes. that was, I'm, I'm guessing that was all the rage in about the 18 teens and, or 19 teens, 1920s was, uh, I think of as the yeah, big Yeah, and a little spire. earlier than that. Uh, the region had so many springs, it was just a, almost natural that that would happen. Uh, people were looking for ways to cure themselves and, and you know, before we had uh, modern uh, medicine, mm -hmm. uh, springs were <clears throat> a place they could go and get some comfort, especially if it was a hot spring. We don't have the hot springs here, but mm -hmm. uh, they do down at Hot Springs right. Arkansas, in Arkansas. But uh, they would drink the water and take baths in it and probably did some exercising, some walking and that sort of thing and they could stay in a nice hotel. Mm -hmm. And so it was a pretty popular thing for people. And like Eureka Springs, Arkansas became a resort town. Mm -hmm. And we've been building resort towns ever since then. As you point out in your book, most of the new towns are basically resort towns that right. have cropped up in the right. 20th century. Sure. In the Ozarks. Um, and it seems to work. <laughs> yeah, and tourism is still a big part of uh, Ozark's life. Um, i got to ask you a question. Do you think, you know, a lot of reservoirs have been built, uh, dams that created reservoirs have been built in the Ozarks upland. And it's, uh, my sense is it's a, it's a sore topic among Ozarkers. If that was a good thing in the long haul or a bad thing for the region. That we now have so many reservoirs. Um, what, what, do you, what is your thought? How did that affect Ozark life and culture in general? Well, it, it's kind of a double-edged sword uh, with a lot of people because, you know, places like the Bull Shoals and Schoolcraft talked about the, uh, getting blocked, get these canoe crosswise in the, in the, in the shoals there, mm -hmm. just south of the big, uh, the North Fork River, mm -hmm. just shortly below that, 20 miles or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a wonderful story, you know, how he yeah. got, to, he lodged his canoe in there three different times. And it, it's, it, and you can just picture that in your mind, but you can't see it anymore, because right. it's under the lake. Right. And even, uh, you point out in your book that, uh, Montine, the site of Montine is underwater now. And uh, during the drought of 1975, the uh, Beaver Lake level got so low that you could go explore that right. archaeological site almost at that point. And then, right. Uh, I hurried down there and got some pictures. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so a lot of that, you know, in, in the bottom land was the more fertile land in the Ozarks, so it affected agriculture. Oh, yes. I mean, there were a lot of settlements that were displaced. Lynn Creek up in uh, Camden County was totally displaced by the uh, uh, Bagnell Dam and what we now call Lake of the Ozarks. Um, this just happened throughout the Ozarks. That it changed the life and culture. Of the most, most of the people who settled here, <clears throat> the frontiersmen, and even the early settlers after that, always settled on the good land. It made sense mm -hmm. to settle on. They had water there. Mm -hmm. uh, they had some protection from storms and so forth mm -hmm. down behind the hills. Mm -hmm. uh, it made a good place to settle. And yeah. when the schoolcraft went down the river on the White River, and there were settlers there then, all those settlement sites were along the river mm -hmm. or streams. Mm -hmm. And uh, Holt and Fisher, mm -hmm. the two men who led him up to Springfield, 
uh, lived in the bot in a, on a well what geologists would call the slip off slope or the bottom lands on the inside of a meander loop. Right. And and that's where they settled. They they picked that as the place to settle, and mm -hmm. so did all the others. Yeah. How about the settlement of Springfield itself? Was it uh, the the spring that w w we're not on a river? Uh -huh. Well, other than Jordan Creek, I guess it'd be the best yeah. we can muster. Well, and the James River, but that's sort of on the south edge of our city. Yeah. But um, would have been miles away. At yeah. The our, point of our, well, Schoolcraft settled about a, maybe a mile and a half from my house here. Mm -hmm. So we're here on the, <clears throat> off of uh, uh, Sunshine Street. Yeah. Might not be a mile and a half, might be more like a mile. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they, he knew about and had been told there was a lead deposit there, and the hunters had used it, the Indians had used it for a long time mm -hmm. to dig uh, lead and melt, mainly to make bullets and whatever thing else they might be able to make with it. But, um, and he, they found it, and they stayed here five days. Build a little smelter, which they would. Uh, I've seen drawings of these things. Uh, mm -hmm. There's nothing left there now. Mm -hmm. There's nothing left, mm -hmm. and I, I was not able to find any lead there either. Mm -hmm. But it could have been mined out. I'm not really sure. I don't did see any mine mining right there. Of course, this whole area from the mouth of Pearson Creek was where the he dug lead. But right up Pearson Creek and right up here in, in this same subdivision that I'm in here, uh, up on the hill by Linwood Boulevard, uh, the, the subdivision swimming pool is right beside an old lead smelter. And you can drive there and see it now. You can see the foundation works, and uh, but the uh, Department of Natural Resources uh, thought it, since there was so much lead, you know, their refinement processes weren't very good. And, you know, when that was mined, uh, the last mining there was probably in the 1930s. And <coughs> so that a lot of lead was left in it, mm -hmm. in, the, in the slag pile. Mm -hmm. So they made the subdivision cover it up. Mm -hmm. So we had to. Oh, really? Pay for covering that whole slag pile hey, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to make it safe. Uh -huh. So there was quite a mining district right in here, and they, they mined over uh, <clears throat> probably a half a billion dollars worth of uh, lead out of this area. Yeah. Uh, starting in about <coughs> probably the 18, well, they opened those mines pretty early down there where uh, schoolcraft work, but <coughs> and they were shipping. Let out in, in in real, uh, it, you know, Joplin and that area opened up around the 1870s. So probably the oldest lead mine in western Missouri is this lead mine down mm. here on Pearson Creek. Really, at Schoolcraft, he'd heard about it. Or he, he, <laughs> he had heard about it. I suppose that kind of uh, information as hunters come in, from trapping and all that. So that's kind of information about lead because they knew about lead mining over in, at Potosi and in those towns. Moses Austin was, had made himself a pretty wealthy man. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, running mining operations back there mm -hmm. um, in a number of places. Potosi was probably the largest uh, town mm -hmm. where they, where they had smelters and and did a lot of smelting. Yeah, and that was his starting off point, really, for his. Uh, yeah, and so they knew that it, if that money could be made with lead. Yeah. So, if there was word of it, why then I think I think um, I think Schoolcraft really was when he came west. I think he got here along in August in 1818. Mm -hmm. Got to Potosi. Uh, his biographer uh, says that uh, he probably was just trying to find a new new place to make a living. And he had in mind 
since he loved minerals and mining and all that sort of thing, that he probably had in the back of his mind uh, to somehow wrangle a job as the federal mine inspector for that whole area there. Yeah. And he was going to do that by taking his mineral collections and his writings, because he'd written a, a book called View of the Lead Mines of Missouri, mm -hmm. and he took that and shook, he got into some pretty important people. Uh, uh, Senator Benton from Missouri and uh, the Secretary of State, I think, I can't remember his name right now, but uh, President Monroe, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, all got copies of the, of the book, Yeah. but he didn't get the job there. It worked for him later on, though, to get the job with the Cass Expedition that, that explored the source of the Mississippi River and yeah. the Western Lake area. He was the governor of Michigan yeah. and wanted to find out more <clears throat> what was out there. Yeah. <laughs> And Schoolcraft got the job then, perhaps because of the book they wrote here, they put him in the job of recording their their tour. So it was not his book was not only important for the region and the development of the region and the development of the sense of a region, but also his own career. It sort of launched his. Oh own career. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, he was a young man when he was out here. Right, and I think he probably heard about this lead from somebody, maybe from Moses Austin. Who knows? Yeah. He would, he would be likely a person who might want to know about that. Yeah. And so he set about trying to put together a group to come out here. It ended up he only had one other guy to go with him, yeah. Levi Pettibone. Yeah. <laughs> the rest of them. I think he got more than he bargained for, too. By, yeah. the, by, the, by the end of December, I think he was uh, ready to turn around. <laughs> oh, and they, they made a lot better time going home than they did coming <laughs> That's out. That's right. <laughs> They stuck to the waterways. Uh, yeah, pretty and, much. Yeah. And, and <laughs> um, trails. Also in your book, you talk about phases of white settlement of the Ozarks. So just to briefly summarize, if you want to comment. So there's the, what you call the old Ozarks frontier, basically French and German settlers. Um, right. Pre-Civil War. Um, and, and as you point out, it, it, these phases, they tended to layer. They didn't displace a previous phase. They layered intermingled with an existing. So you had the old Ozarks frontier, then you had what you call the New South Ozarks after the Civil War. Uh, yeah, when the come, railroads came in, yeah. lots of, lots of uh, business opportunities, yep. money uh, came in to the, to the area, and that's continued really right up to the present because uh, <clears throat> you know, all these people that come into the Ozarks, whether they're from Minnesota or Iowa or Kansas or Nebraska or wherever they're from, uh, you don't see as many people migrating from Kentucky and Tennessee because they got the same thing back there. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> when, they, uh, when they move to the Ozarks, most people take their money with them. Exactly. And they deposit that in the bank. And we know about how banks can loan more than they actually have on them. So it really put, helped to build uh, investment in the Ozarks. Yeah. Money doesn't do any good doing nothing. Right. So people who had made money other places retired here. Many of them, not all of them, but many of them put that money back to work. And yeah. that, that has really helped the uh, growth of the Ozarks. Uh, and then you had World War One, the New Deal era. Uh, you know, Power Site Dam that we mentioned was a private venture, as right. was Bagnell Dam. But then you had the federal projects, Table Rock. Oh, and, yeah. Um, and um, sort of the WPA did a lot of work in the region. Um, tremendous amount of work. Yeah. They really did. Yeah. And a lot of places they did that. Yeah. Courthouses, people were building new course at courthouses when they didn't need them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they just wanted to work. Yeah. They needed so. the work. Then I was wondering, you know, are we into maybe a fourth phase of, of white settlement? Maybe, maybe I'm just because I, I grew up in Iowa and I feel like I'm a part of this, but... Um, I don't know what to call it. Retirees and near retirees from the old Northwest. I mean, you know, some of the jokes is, one of the jokes of the Ozarks is that some of these towns now are basically suburbs of Chicago. There's so many retirees yeah. from Chicago down there that it's become a sub of suburb of Chicago, a distant suburb of Chicago. I mean, do you think that's enough of a phenomenon that it warrants being yet a fourth phase of white settlement of the Ozarks? What, what I call the near retirees. Um, 
which are also, as you put on the book, yeah. bo- boomerangers, that they go out, they grow up in the Ozarks, they go out and do great things, but they are pulled back, they want to come back. Right. When they're getting into their 50s and 60s, and think, well, we'll come back, slow down a little bit, this would be a great place to retire. We see a lot of that going on in the Ozarks mm-hmm. now. And I, I remember interviewing a, a man from Christian County uh, <clears throat> down on Bull Creek, and he had uh, moved, when the Depression hit, he moved down here thinking he could live cheap down here. And I think a lot of people did think that, that yeah. he, he could subsist in this kind of an environment. Right. And you could grow, well, you could grow anything, of course. It was, yeah. That was the message that went out after the lumber mills sold off their land. <laughs> <laughs> you could grow anything down here. <coughs> but then, when things opened up, when the war got going, World War II, he moved back to Chicago and got his old job back. Mm-hmm. And he worked up there till he retired, and then he moved back down here. Mm-hmm. This is really where he wanted to live. Mm-hmm. So, but he was following the jobs. And, yeah, following the job when he had when the, when the money could be made, and yeah. and uh, moved back down here. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you think there's enough of that going on now that for see for the last 20, 25 years that this is a a fourth wave of white settlement. Yeah, in the from about the mid '60s. Uh-huh. Um, I have a graph in my book that shows that definite break along there in the '60s, and it went right up. Yeah, there was a plateau in population of the Ozarks, and then it started going up. Yeah, um, and it's never, it's really never stopped. It's still those counties are still growing. And you kind of the other thing you point out is that there's. Um, there are a lot of oddballs in the Ozarks. You know, you get countercultural types, and you know they're building a mm-hmm. medieval castle, or they're you know uh, whatever. You know, uh, you just get a lot of uh, countercultural groups that are attracted to the Ozarks. Would you say? Well, yeah, we uh, Russ Gerlock, Doctor Gerlock, he's retired, and I'm not sure where Russ is today, but. <laughs> Uh, he and I used to go around to a lot of the uh, hippie colonies, I guess you'd call them, yeah. and just to see what was going on. And and there were a number of them, and I'm sure we didn't find them all, but but we tried to find them all. Mm-hmm. So they were here, and many of them still here. Mm-hmm. You know, they're doing doing pretty well. Uh, some of them were religious connected, had their own. There's some mod- couple of them had their own, uh, their own religion, really, mm-hmm. and uh, I never will forget the one time my Dr. Hughes, which was, who was my dissertation advisor, and so was he was also Russ's advisor. So we got him to come down here and give a talk, and then we thought we'd take him down to uh, Douglas County, the mill down there that has the real nice meal meals. Mm-hmm. So my memory slips my my memory is not working right now. But on the way down we went, there was a little shack along the road. And uh, right along Highway Five. And I think it was kind of a trailer house and kind of a building built onto it. And so we were gonna go over there and take a picture of it. And when we got there Dr. Hughes was pretty old then. Why a guy jumped up out of the weeds and had a rifle in his hand. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it coming, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bob Flanders was with us too. And uh, anyway, the, uh, the upshot of it all was he's a pretty nice guy, yeah. and he had moved down here from some place I can't remember where. At <clears throat> But he, he, he didn't want people intruding. Yeah. So he, he wasn't from the Ozarks, really. He was just a guy that came in here and yeah. kind of had what most people would think Ozarkers are like. They An Ozarker sure. attitude. Yeah, a moonshiner or something. Yeah. He just didn't. But once he found out we were just down there having our own way of having a good time, right. he, he was fine. Yeah. He told us, told us his life story, really. But that initial kind of, you know, this is my place, and yeah, I'm going to right. be suspicious of you until I learn otherwise. Right. Yeah. And I got my 
rifle here to make sure it goes that way. Yeah. A <laughs> um, couple of other questions and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, do you think the Ozark Upland is a unified region? Do you think that, or is it really almost like some uh, city-states in Italy before the unification that just happened to be in the same peninsula? Yeah, I, I think I picked the, the city-state idea. Because places like uh, the Joplin area, it, you know, that's a big city now. And, well, at least a medium-sized city. And, and the Northwest Arkansas is really, uh, I think in my book I call it Northwest Arkansas City because Fayetteville and right. all those towns have kind of grown together yeah. now. Yeah. And a tremendous, tremendous amount of wealth there with uh, all the big companies, uh, mm -hmm. Tyson, and Walmart. Tyson and Walmart and the big trucking company uh, mm -hmm. that's uh, based there too. They just, uh, they just aren't like other parts of the Ozarks. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what you call Branson, but it's certainly not like the rest of the Ozarks. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a tourist town. It's yeah. a tourist industry. Yeah. And they have a lot of things to offer. I think of the, you know, being able to live here and all my kids I grew up with or young people I grew up with are now old people like me and they're driving all the way <laughs> from north central Kansas to get to see the shows it's that I can just drop down whenever I feel like it. Yeah, now someone pointed out to me that I thought it was a good observation, but I want to get your take on it. They, you know, um, I had a chance to uh, tour uh, Disney's Imagineering Studios, and it was fascinating, but the placement of Disneyland in Anaheim, in Orange County, California, was just a land deal. There was no, there was no reason why it had to yeah. be there. It was just a place to put this concept of a theme park. Right. The person pointed out to me, said that really the Branson Entertainment phenomenon was not some corporation just saying, we need a place to do this and this is it for whatever reason. Yeah. It was indigenous to that location. That sort of hospitality, tourism was already there and that flowering of the Branson Entertainment phenomenon was just a an extension of something that was already there in the indigenous nature of that region. What do you think? Right. Tourism really was, the dam itself was a big factor, but even yeah. before that, Harold Bell Wright's book was a big yeah. uh, attraction. People wanted to go see where... Tiny so Como was, was a big thing. Mm -hmm. I don't, don't think people these days realize what an important book that was, really. I've heard that it's, the, it's, if you just count printings of a book, it's number three. I know the Bible's yeah. number one. In Could English, be. I don't. I, I don't forget know. what's number two, and and Shepherd of the Hills is number three. Right. But you know, uh, I've been here long enough to really see that area transform. Because uh, when we first start going to Silver Dollar City, it was free. You just went down there. They wanted you to come because they had things to sell you. Mm -hmm. And uh, then they found out they could start charging for it. They added different things. And, and the country music theaters were all really independent theaters. There wasn't any big company that came in and built palaces and that sort of thing, although some of those buildings are pretty remarkable buildings. Mm -hmm. But it, it really, uh, it is homegrown. Yeah, it's really <laughs> not, there's not three corporations that are running all those shows. Yeah. And, you know, that's a, so. very much a homegrown thing. Um, do you think that sort of these this flowering of entertainment, again, it seems more pronounced in the Ozarks than maybe other regions. I think of the the Ozark Jubilee uh, nationally broadcast uh, mm -hmm. television show in the late fifties was mm -hmm. uh, it was a big deal in its day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, and it drew in a lot of talent. It was kind of drawing on local talent, but it drew in talent as well. Um, mm -hmm. And I would see even. The fact that it's not a you know, coincidence that the end of the Ozark Jubilee era almost abuts the development of the Branson Entertainment District. Mm -hmm. It does. Uh, and, but you still see these local bands. People have a real liking for local music and mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they kind of come and go. Mm -hmm. 
but uh, where is it? Down at Oldfield, I think it is. They have Oldfield a, has one. McClurg time. has one every Monday night. Yeah. They have a jam session. And, yeah, uh, and, and that, I don't know how long that one's been going, but the Oldfield thing's been going for a long time. Yeah. And, and you'll even see people from the branching shows come up there. Uh -huh. They're probably from that area. Yeah. But they'll come up there and perform. Yeah. Not every night, but whenever they have a hankering to do it, I guess. Yeah, it's just um, a way of um, doing that. Um, some people have suggested that the Ozarks is primarily just a Western replication of Appalachia. What do you th what do you say to that? Well, in in uh, in physical geography, that's true. I'm not sure it is in cultural geography, but probably to some extent it is because a lot of the people came from Appalachia over to the Ozarks, Kentucky, Tennessee, uh, even back into North Carolina, a lot of settlers came from there. And, uh, but physically, geologists trace the Appalachian Mountains as they come south into Georgia, and then they swing back west and dip underneath the Mississippi River and pop up again here in the Ozarks, mm. and then they go off southwest and pop up again down in uh, the central Texas hill country. Mm. So that chain of mountains is a oh, really? so real country, chain of mountains. The hill country west of San Antonio is part of that Yeah, yeah. geologic yeah. feature. Yeah, I had a... Uh, a, a geographer I know who did a really nice dissertation and I think wrote a book eventually on the uh, German migration. A lot of the Germans came down, you know, they tended to follow the rivers, but then they got in the, in the uh, settling the parts of the hill country and they ended up down there. Hmm. And that's full of Germans in this country too. Yeah. Uh, last th last question I have for you, and I appreciate your time, um, is um, when I got down here, someone suggested that to understand the Ozarks, you have to understand that it's really the intersection of the Midwestern mindset, the Southern mindset, and the Western mindset. Well, probably so. <laughs> probably so. I often told people that that uh, when I first came down here from Kansas, I didn't see this was a strange place to be because it was a rural area. I grew up in a very, very rural area. Mm -hmm. And you know, we, if we wanted to go shopping, we went to Hastings, Nebraska, or Salina, Kansas, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to do any real shopping because mm -hmm. there weren't very many towns around that was more attractive. But... Uh, I thought the people were just about like the people from Kansas. Mm -hmm. That's how I, you know, in the country people, I had no trouble when I started going out and interviewing people. I had no trouble at all. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, one time I was, I had gone out to uh, interview some of the Amish who had just come in, come in in the 60s, I think it was, mm -hmm. and settled over in the by Seymour, mm -hmm. and uh, the Schwartz family was a major family there, and there was an older gentleman, uh, Sam Schwartz, I'm sure he's not living now, but one time I went, they were building a chicken house that was could also be used as a hog, hog barn, and they're all young guys up on the building, and I, I asked if anybody there could uh, tell me, talk to me. It's kind of hard to tell them uh, what you're nosing around about, you know, I want to find out about you people. <laughs> and they said, well, Sam was down uh, over the hill hanging a, a, a cattle, um, hanging one of those deals that you uh, filled with insecticide oh, and yeah. the cattle rub on it. Right, right. And he was, and he was a pretty old guy and I, when I got down there well, and he had a horse and buggy and um, and I started asking him a few questions and he was didn't like, he, he didn't sound like he was very interested 
<laughs> and then, but he was having trouble getting that up there. And I said, here, let me get up in that tree and you hand it to me and I can tie it off up here. And uh, so he did, and I, I tied it off. I came back down and he says, now what was it you wanted to know? And, <laughs> and he says, well, we'll just hop in the buggy here and we'll go around and look at a few things. So, hmm. so I, I didn't really have any trouble fitting in even with yeah. the, with the people who don't fit in all the time with everybody. Yeah, good. Well, it is a unique region. Yeah, the Ozarks is a Thank unique region. Thank you very region. much, appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, allowing me to interview you today. Oh, no problem.